All right, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 10, please. We're finishing up that chapter this morning. The story of Cornelius. Beginning at verse 24. Acts chapter 10, verse 24. <coughs> and you know what's first? Essentially, she's, she's a step ahead. <laughs> She's going for the star today. Yeah. So number one, or chapter one is ascension and appointment. Chapter two, Pentecost. Pentecost and Peter's preaching. Let's say that with authority. I like that. Chapter three, Amen. layman and lesson. Chapter four, restraint, release, and request. All right. Chapter five, deception and detention. The, the jailing of all the apostles. And the story of Ananias and Sapphira. All right. Chapter six. The seven servants selected to solve that problem with the Grecian widows. Chapter 7, Stephen Stone, first martyr for Christ. Chapter 8, Samaria and salvation. Chapter 9, Saul saved and Dorcas delivered. And then where we are this morning, chapter 10, is the conversion of Cornelius. So Cornelius converted. All right, very good. All right, we're going to resume where we left off. As we recall, just a real brief review. I don't like spending a lot of time on reviews. Um, we had the description of Cornelius at the start of chapter 10, and then his vision. And then Peter had a vision, so we had those two visions. And the chapter, or our study, concluded this past Wednesday with Cornelius sending, as commanded by the angel, sending his servants and a soldier to go get Peter, who was where again? Joppa, because he had finished up working there in uh, chapter 9, uh, raising Dorcas. So they arrived, and uh, Peter had been instructed by the Holy Spirit, there's some men coming to get you, you go with them without any misgivings. Don't ask questions, don't raise objections, you just go. And that's where we left off. So uh, Peter has left Joppa, and he is now arriving in Caesarea, where Cornelius was. And look at verse 24, Luke just... Uh, for our purposes, it's where we start, but it's in the continuation of the flow of thought. Cornelius was waiting for him. On the following day, he, Peter, entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and his close friends. I'm going to make this an application for the end of class this morning. Here's a man that was so interested because, again, his character was described at the start of chapter 10. He prayed. He gave alms. He was a God-fearing man, um, uh, devout, verse 2. Here's a, here's a spiritually interested man. And so, after he complies with the angelic instructions to send for Peter, so you can imagine he's just, he's just anxious for Peter to get to town, which, as Luke writes in verse 24, he's waiting for him. But he's done something else, too. Not only is he interested, but what has he done? Yes, he's made sure others are going to be exposed to the truth he's going to hear. And that's a commendable trait, and we'll talk more about that at the end of our class this morning. I think that's uh, conduct that's worthy of our imitation. But he does something wrong when Peter gets to town. What does he do? He falls down and worships him. An in inappropriate greeting. This isn't the only time we'll see this in the Acts record. Uh, we'll see it with Paul and Barnabas when they begin their journeys. In chapter 13, I believe it is. So what, is, what does Peter do? Does he receive that? Not for a second. He helps him up. I get the idea from verse, 20, verse 26. Peter raised him up. And he said what? Hey, I'm, I'm like you. I'm just a man. Uh, we only worship the Lord. We don't, we don't, we don't take part in this. So uh, Peter corrects that. I don't think he really slammed him hard about it. But he just, he just politely and tactfully said, you know, we don't. We don't have any of that. Please, please get up. And then uh, look at verse 27. As he talked with him, he entered, and I think that to mean the house, and he sees all these people that are assembled that Cornelius has invited. I wonder how much Peter was taken back by that. <laughs> well, how big of a crowd it was, if, if the house was full, if the room was full. Uh, when, we're never told how many he invited. This says in verse 27, many people are there. So it's not just a handful. And... Peter says something to me that's interesting. 
And this is coming from an apostle. And we'll say more about this in a minute. But what does he say? Yes, he says, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate or to visit, uh, excuse me, a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit with him. And by that he politely is saying a Gentile, all right, foreigner, someone who's not a Jew. But, he says, now that's, that's the first half of that, and he says, but he, but he says what? Yet, what's happened? God has shown me. God has taught me a lesson. God has shown me that I should not call any man un unholy or unclean. And we used this verse this past Wednesday. We jumped ahead and referred to it. Now we're going to refer back to where we used it, verses, uh, verses 13 to 15. That was in the context of Peter's vision. What were the instructions in the vision when he saw that sheet coming down? Again, what was on the sheet? Animals. And the voice was what? The voice said... Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, I've never done that. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And the reply to that was, what God has called clean, or what God has cleansed, no man should call unclean. Now, if that's all we had, we didn't have any more information about that statement, we would have thought God was referring to those animals. And maybe in the shorter context he was, but when Peter says this in verse 28, we know there was a bigger lesson that was involved. Really, what was God talking about? He was looking ahead, talking about men, particularly the Gentiles. So Peter was admitting, well, you know, really, it's not right for me to be here. Formally, it was unlawful for me to be here, but God has shown me. See, what about the apostles? Did they have everything always figured out? Who were inspired men? They had, they had access to truth that you and I are never going to have. I believe Paul refers to it in Ephesians 3 as apostolic insight. They, they, they had that. But he's still a man. And he didn't have it all worked out in his mind either. God had to show me this. I had to learn this lesson. Well, in that, the Acts 15, we're going to see that because they have to come together and confer among themselves. Yes, they do. When the question of circumcision comes up. That's right, Acts 15. And we'll get there eventually. So it's a misunderstanding that God had recently corrected in his life. And so he, that's, that's dispensed with, that's taken out of the way. So he says now, in verse uh, 29, this is why I came without even raising an objection, which is, that's what he was told to do. So he just simply asked, all right, why did you send for me? Why am I here? It's a proper question. And Cornelius then shares the details of what? He, he tells him, well, I had this vision. So he tells him what all his vision was, verses 30 through 32. Behold, at this four days ago at this hour, I was praying uh, during the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in shining garments, referencing the angel, obviously, and said to me, your prayer has been heard. So we mentioned this past Wednesday night. Did God hear Cornelius' prayer? Yes, this verse says that he did. But again, there's no relationship there, so he can't call on him in that, in, in that way of praying as father, because God's not his father yet. But God did hear his prayer. And your alms have been remembered before God. Then the specific instructions, you send men to Joppa, go get Peter, bring him here, and he will have something to say to you. So that's through verse 32. So Cornelius then says a little more um, niceties, if you will. He says, verse 33, and I have sent to you immediately, and you've been very kind to come. Sort of an appreciative comment. I, you know, that there's, there's no delay here. You came right here. Now, here's the commendable part of verse 33. What's he say? And th this, this admission that the gathering Peter sees in his home is coinciding with Peter's visit. What's he say? We're here. That's why we're here. We want to hear what you've got to say that God's told you to tell us. Because earlier, <coughs> again, this is, Back in verse, um, verse 6, the end of verse 6, some versions, I think particularly the New King James, inserts this statement that's not in other versions, but it is in chapter 11. What was the last thing the angel told Cornelius after he's supposed to send for Peter? And when he comes, what's going to happen? He's going to speak to you. He's, he's got something that he's going to say to you. 
And so Cornelius is referencing that in verse 33. That's why we're present. We, we really want to, we desire to hear what God has been uh, commanding you to tell us. And so that's the, that's the purpose of the visit right there, Peter. That's it in a nutshell. So all that is dispensed with before Peter ever, even begins his, his address. All right. So here's the message from Peter, verses 34 through 43. So far, when we've seen Peter speak, um, besides in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it's been a full-blown address or a sermon. I don't know if we can call this a sermon. Maybe we could call it that. To me, this is more informal than a, addressing the assembly in Jerusalem. But it, I mean, it is an assembly. But it's not an assembly of Christians. But be that as it may, Peter begins with an admission. And this goes back again to verse, what he said in verse 28. He says, I most certainly understand, and then my version adds the word now. That, that word now is in italics. But I believe it's proper. I most certainly understand now. I get it now. I didn't get it before because he's already admitted what? Formally, verse 28. It wouldn't have been lawful for me to be here. But I had to learn this lesson. But now I understand that God is not one to do what? Yeah, th there's no more partiality. Under the law was there partiality. Obviously, the Gentiles were not in covenant with Jehovah. They weren't part of the covenant. Lots of verses that could be used to, to uh, illustrate that. But now Peter says, God doesn't show partiality, but in every nation, every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right or works righteousness is what? God will receive him. God welcomes that, that person. So Peter admits at the outset, God-fearing and truth-seeking Gentiles were now going to be acceptable to God in his kingdom. And that has not happened until now. Had it always been talked about? Yes, it had been prophesied of. And even Jesus, I, I believe, talked about it. Now, let's stop for a moment and, and remind ourselves, who is a proselyte? He's a Gentile, but how's he living? Like a Jew. He's not staying a full-fledged Gentile. He had been converted to Judaism. He had been keeping the law. And we, ha we have had proselytes. Hold your place here real quickly. Let's take the time to do this. Chapter 2, when the gospel begins, when the Holy Spirit falls upon the apostles, <coughs> look at verse 5. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from where? Every nation. Well, drop down to verse 10. What's the last word in verse 10? Proselytes. So there were, there were full-blooded Jews there. Of course, they were in Jerusalem because the law said, you, this is one of the high feast days, you come. But proselytes were there as well. Chapter 6 and verse 5. Who was one of the servants that were chosen? The seven selected. A proselyte. End of verse 5. Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And in chapter 8, we talked about the eunuch. He had been to Jerusalem to worship, but where was he from? So more or less, we assume, conclude, maybe it's incorrect, but I assume he was a proselyte as well. Yes. Yes, there was a huge Jewish population there. You're right. Historically, we know that. So whether he was or not doesn't take away from these two. We've already been looking at proselytes. Okay, they, They've been in the picture. But again, back in Acts 10... And at verse, um, find my place here, verse, uh, verse 34, I most certainly understand now, now I get it, that we're talking no longer about full-blooded Jews and Gentiles who we have to refer to as proselytes. We're talking about just full-blooded Gentiles who are still in their paganism, who've never come to God through the law. They're now welcome in the kingdom. And this is one of those, this is one of those huge turning points in the story of Acts. Uh, such would be in every nation, even those who are afar off. A uh, point that I believe David made this past Wednesday night that we had made earlier when looking at chapter 2, when Peter said uh, to repent and be baptized for the promises to you and to your children and to all those who are afar off, the Gentiles. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, Matthew 28, after he said that I have all authority, 
go make disciples of all nations, every nation. Well, if there was only Jews that, who could be in the kingdom, then why talk about all nations? That wouldn't make any sense. So it has been discussed. It's been, it's been pointed at, but it's not happening until right now. And so Peter admits that's, he says, look, I, I, I finally get it. I'm on board with this now in, in, in the complete sense. Now look at verse 36. So all these men, they're welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel. So who got the gospel first? Israel. And lots of New Testament passages illustrate that as well. To them first were committed the oracles of God, Paul would write in one of the epistles. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. What kind of peace? Peace through Jesus Christ. Peace among men. You think? Remember Jesus said in Matthew 10, Do not think that I came to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. So what kind of peace? Between God and man. The ultimate kind of peace. Not, not horizontal peace, but vertical peace. Peace through Jesus Christ. Initially went to Israel. <coughs> Excuse me, verse 36. But verse 37 and 38, Peter says, You yourselves know. Now, this is what my version reads. I believe New King James reads, That word you know. Or you yourselves know. And I want to make a uh, comment on this just in a moment. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John had proclaimed. You know that Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. It seems to me that Peter is, is talking about, if I read that correctly, he's referencing their not too distant memory. And let me illustrate what I mean by that. Here's a map. We're going to look at this real quickly. Again, where are we right now? What city are we in? Caesarea. It's up here on the coast. Down here is Jerusalem. <coughs> Just ballpark figures. They were about 55, it seems, to 60 miles apart. Just as the crow flies. Maybe longer if the road was crooked, but that, for our purposes, that's, that's sufficient. All right. Now, what's the point I'm making here? Well, it's, it seems to me, and I, again, I'm using round figures. It may not have been any more than five to ten years since the church began in Acts chapter 2. And maybe even more so if you tack on the three years of Jesus' ministry before that. Maybe eight to ten years from the start of the Lord's ministry to where we are here in Acts 10. All right? That should be... 13, 8 to 13 years. I can't do math this morning. So maybe less than 15 years. When Peter says, look back again at verse 37. He says, you yourselves know this. And again, who's he talking to? Gentiles. What would have been their religious perspective? Because before now, before you answer that, before now, when an audience was being addressed, whether it was a large audience like in Acts chapter 2 or small groups, who had they been preaching to? Jews. So what would have been the perspective of the, of the audience? They would have said things that they would recognize. They mentioned the prophets. They mentioned the law. They mentioned uh, David, like in the sermon in Acts 2. So all these things were mentioned. And they went, yeah, I, I know that name. That makes sense to me. But now these are Gentiles. They've got no point of reference. Nothing. So it seems that Peter is referencing not only, not so much their religious past, but things that they would have known just by living in this area in maybe no more than 10, 13, 15 years. I think that's what he's saying. You, you maybe have heard of these things. All this area is, I don't know what the square mileage is, but I mean, it's not like it's halfway around the world. These would have been events that have been talked about. They would have heard about them. They would have known about them. Is it possible that some in Caesarea on this day could have even heard the Lord preach when he was on the earth? Possible. Can't prove it. But again, it's not like it's halfway around the world. Tony, your hand was up. Yeah, I just want to say this is such a great person to start with, too, because he was a God fearing person already, his, his household life. Yeah. And so people around him would be more receptive, and that's a great way to do it. And sometimes we need to use that. So yes. Look for the person who is your in, and then yes. the start from where they are exactly. and go from that perspective. That's, that's a good point. So uh, Peter states, again, verse 37. That you, you knew these things. And I'm making a distinction between the previous addresses like chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 13, which we haven't gotten to yet. 
But Peter in chapter 2 was preaching to Jews. He referenced multiple passages in the law, the prophets. When Stephen gave his defense in chapter 7, he referenced the prophets, the law. What would that have meant to this group of people? Not, not much. Maybe a little, but not as much as it meant to them. And when Paul was in Antioch of Pisidia, chapter 13, he gives a, another Jewish history because he's talking in a synagogue. He's talking to Jews. So Peter, it seems to me, as, as, as Tanya mentioned, he's, he's taking a different approach. Jesus traveled all throughout. I feel like John Madden when I do this. You know, just, He just went through all over everywhere, traveling, preaching, encountering all sorts of people. And I take this as Peter saying, Look, you've heard the stories. You know what happened. Jesus did all these acts or deeds of good. He healed people. He cast out demons. You've heard about these things. And that seems to be his approach. So time and distance. Distance being between, you know, Caesarea and Jerusalem. Or time since the kingdom began. Or even since the Lord's ministry. That seems to be the reference Peter is using. You know these things happen. And I'm telling you, that's what we've been preaching about. That's, that's behind all that we're uh, uh, speaking about as the witnesses. That seems to be what he's saying, at least uh, to me. So I, I wanted to emphasize that, take a few minutes and do that this morning before we go any further in um, Peter's comments. So, verse 39. Now here's some points that we've looked at previously. We are witnesses of all these things. Again, who's the we? The apostles. We are witnesses of all these things. He did both in the land, <coughs> excuse me, of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And then what does he say? The last part of verse 39. They killed him. We've heard that before numerous times. They put him to death. What's the next point? Verse 40. Another familiar point. God raised him up. So the Jews killed him, but God raised him up and showed him openly, very visible. Then to verse uh, 40. And then verse 41, uh, this uh, visibly showing Jesus wasn't seen to everybody. Not everybody saw him, but only to selected witnesses. Verse 41, who were chosen beforehand by God, that is to us, that in us apostles, we apostles, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. So these three points are ones that we have seen emphasized in previous addresses in the book of Acts, in sermons, in, in, in preaching. We're witnesses. There was this man named Jesus, and God, and the, you Jews, you killed him, but God raised him up. He has, he has been exalted to God's right hand. All right, so those are familiar points. Again, we've seen that previously. Now, verse 42. So after all that was emphasized, here's the, here's the work of the witnesses. God has ordered us to preach to the people and to solemnly testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. I don't remember, I could be wrong, but I don't think this has been emphasized previously in the book of Acts, him being judge. It will be later on when Paul was in Athens. Look at that familiar verse in Acts 17 and it's verse 31. Verse 31. When he's preaching on Mars Hill, again, this, this illustrates the point Tanya made earlier. This address that Paul gave was not like his address in Antioch of Pisidia because he's talking to pagan philosophers who were not believers. So he approached it differently. Remember how he, um, how he concluded? Verse 30, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained to be that judge. So that certainly coincides with what Peter says here. So again, that's, that's nothing new. I don't recall uh, an, an apostle emphasizing Jesus' role or his actions as humanity's judge. Maybe I'm overlooking it, but I don't, I don't think they have. But be that as it may, that, that's emphasized here in this short address to the house of Cornelius. He's the judge of the living and the dead. And then Peter does reference who in verse 43? Prophets. <clears throat> Prophets also bearing witness that everyone who through his name, or they bear witness through that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives remission or forgiveness of sin. So again, there's that word everyone. 
that uh, not just Jews, anybody. Can anybody believe in Jesus? Yes, any, any, anybody can. So that was the content of Peter's message. <clears throat> I don't think he was through talking. In fact, I know he wasn't because our, our next major point is there's an interruption, isn't there? Verse 44 says, while Peter was still speaking, what else he had planned to say? No, no. But what happens? All right, this is, this is the defining moment when you come to Acts 10. I would, I would suggest this is the moment that you emphasize to the children. This changed everything. This, this interruption, if you will. This was God, in a sense, commenting on what's taking place. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. <clears throat> Do we know, because there's several people in the room, how many were in the gathered in the house? Do we know only on to whom he fell? Was it everybody? Was it literally everybody in the room? And I'm asking that because I want you to look at verse 45. Luke, by inspiration, makes very careful effort to make this distinction. Who did the Holy Spirit fall on? Everyone who heard who was a Gentile. Look in verse 45. And all the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles. So the Jewish believers who came with Peter, and I misspoke this past Wednesday night, and Gary correctly pointed out verse, uh, verse uh, let me find it right quick, verse 12, thank you, of chapter 11, six brethren from Joppa came with Peter. Well, I take that to be those of the circumcised believers. The Holy Spirit didn't fall on them, only on the Gentiles. So Luke makes an important distinction because we're dealing with the Gentile issue here. Not the Jews, but the Gentiles. Only on them did the Holy Spirit fall. They were amazed. Because what did they witness after the Holy Spirit was through falling on them? What did they do? They spoke in tongues and glorified or exalted, magnified God. All right? Back to chapter 2. Now hold your place in chapter 2 because we're going to come back here just in a few minutes. Chapter 2. Verses 1 through 4, a verse that we looked at several weeks ago. On the day of Pentecost had fully come, and the apostles were together in one place. What happened? The Holy Spirit fell upon them. What's the first thing they did? Spoke in tongues, dropped down to verse 11, the last part of verse 11, after all those different peoples are listed. And they're saying, we see all these men from all these places. We hear them in our own language speaking of the mighty deeds of God. They were exalting. They were doing just exactly what the apostle did in Acts chapter 2. No different. The only difference is what between Acts 2 and Acts 10? Jews in Acts 2, Gentiles in Acts 10. That's the difference. And I believe, of course, we all believe this was done for a reason. This was done specifically for that reason. So they were witnessing the Gentiles speaking. Uh, this extraordinary behavior. That was not being done the minute before, but now it is. So that's through verse 46. Then Peter says something, and I believe Brother Waldron makes this comment in his book that we may use as our curriculum. <coughs> Peter wasn't asking permission to baptize these men. This, this is just a rhetorical question. Considering what they all just witnessed, what's Peter say? All right, can anybody give me one good reason why these people should not be baptized? Can anybody forbid water? Speak up. Give us a good reason why they should not be converted. It's a teaching point. We'll get to just in a moment. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. That's the end of verse uh, 47. <clears throat> <clears throat> while receiving the Holy Spirit, this, this baptism of the Holy Spirit clearly was a major sign, and I'm, I'm emphasizing major. It, it was the defining moment in this episode that God did to show, look, I'm, I'm making a, a large point with this. I am saying 
there is no longer to be any distinction between Jews and Gentiles. They are, they are as welcome in the kingdom, how they are, just as the Jews were when they obeyed the gospel. And I'm going to signify that by what miraculous event. I'm going to pour forth my spirit on them just like I did upon the apostles in Acts chapter 2. There is no distinction, no difference. In fact, Peter as much says so, doesn't he? They got the spirit just the same way we did. Exactly the same way. No difference. But, that being the case, what did that have to do with these specific Gentile salvation? Not one thing. What still had to happen? They had to obey the gospel, just like any other man does. And that needs to be emphasized. So, it had nothing to do with their individual salvation. We talked a little bit about this in Acts chapter 8, when Peter and John were sent to Samaria. Luke wrote that the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them. They had simply been baptized. So the coming of the Holy Spirit and one's baptism for the mission of sins, they're not the same. They are, they are distinctly different. And why do we have to emphasize that? Well, because what's the major teaching out in the religious world? Oh, it's all connected. No, it's not connected. The Bible doesn't make that connection. They are truly different. And this, to me, is a major text that illustrates that, that total difference. All right. So, since no one could forbid water... No one had an argument about that. What's Peter do? He commands what? You be baptized. We need, we need to baptize these people. So he ordered them to be baptized. That's the first part of verse 48. And then the chapter concludes with what nicety. How about you all stay for a while? How about you stay for a few days? And so Peter and the fellow travelers, they were invited to stay. All right, that's the text. Very familiar story. All right, before we get to our teaching points, uh, you might have a comment you'd like to make. Question, things that went through your mind as you ran through the chapter. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, be, be thinking about the best way, depending on the age you'll be teaching, but be thinking about the best way that you can convey what's going on here. And th this, is a, this is a big issue, all right? And it may get a little murky sometimes because the Holy Spirit's not something we can just easily... You know, sometimes get our heads wrapped around. But what took place here was mainly done to, for, for, for God to say, I'm no longer making any distinctions. This, this is across the board the same, Jew and Gentile alike. And I'm going to show that by giving these uncircumcised Gentiles what I gave the apostles. And they're on equal footing. Now that comes into play in chapter 11, which is the next chapter when Peter has to defend what he did. And Gary mentioned chapter 15. When we get to that chapter, they have that big debate. When Jews told Gentiles, if you want to be saved, what's got to happen? You've got to be circumcised. So that, th this, this plays a big uh, part in the er early stories of Acts. All right, a couple of teaching points and then some uh, uh, application to look at. Baptism of the Holy Spirit upon Cornelius was unique. And I want to emphasize what I mean by that. Because I believe there's actual wording in this chapter and chapter 11 that we'll get to. It had not happened to anybody else since the apostles. And I know that because the day of Pentecost was Peter's only reference. Notice what he says in verse 47. Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. He could have said... If it were happened to other people, well, you know, just like it happened to Simon or like it happened to the eunuch in Ethiopia or like it happened to the Samaritans. He didn't talk about that because what was the only other time it happened? At the beginning. That was his only point of reference. Chapter 11, verses 15 to 17. Look at that real quickly. He, when, when he's defending himself while the Jews are questioning him, he says, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us when? At the beginning. Beginning of what? The church, Acts chapter 2. And verse 16, that caused Peter to remember what? What, what was brought to his memory? What did Jesus say? Remember, he said that in Acts chapter 1 before he ascended. So Peter brought, was brought to memory those words. And then verse 17, the first part of verse 17, if God therefore gave to them the same gift as he gave to us, us apostles. So that was Peter's only point of reference. It didn't happen any other time. I think else he would have brought it up. 
So it was unique. Happened just twice. And again, we hammer that because you hear a lot of religious teaching about the Holy Spirit baptism. Well, do you believe in that? Yeah, I believe in that. That's in the Bible. That's, that's in the New Testament. But we're probably going to differ if you talk to somebody about who got it and who's going to get it. The record only gives us two examples. So it, it's, that's, that, that's major. Again, it did not figure into Cornelius' salvation. Not at all. That wasn't part of that. They had to obey the Lord just like anyone else who's baptized has to obey the Lord. And Peter commands that at the end of this chapter. Again, it was God's way of signifying the Gentiles had finally gained acceptance into this promised kingdom. And when this whole episode started, again, who else had to be taught that? Who didn't get it right yet? Peter didn't know. God had to show him. He had to be taught and reminded of this. That things have changed. <laughs> things are different. All right, so to me, that's a, that's a major teaching point in this chapter. The other teaching point would be Cornelius had to obey the gospel like anybody else. Let's, let's go through these points real quickly. Did he have to uh, stay in his... And we, we made this point this past Wednesday night. He was a good man. And the world would say, a man that's that good, he's all right before the Lord. Just, just keep on doing what you're doing. He wasn't content to stay in his goodness because he knew it wasn't enough. Number one, did he have to hear the gospel? He had to hear... He had to hear... <laughs> He had to hear or he heard the messages that was taught. He mentions that twice in chapter 10 and chapter 11. We have all, we're all here present to hear what you've been commanded by God to say. He had to believe, didn't he? Look at verse 43 of chapter 10. When Peter says uh, that all, through, all who believe in him receives remission of sins. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. This is right down the gospel template, if you will. What about repentance? Did he have to repent? Look in chapter 11 and verse 18. After Peter relays the story, the Jews said, Well then, God has, God has uh, uh, granted the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. He had to repent. And we've already emphasized then, what about baptism? He was immersed, just like you and I have been immersed. Like anybody has to be immersed. And so Cornelius had to obey the gospel. So emphasize the gospel plan of salvation. Cornelius is right down the template. He did exactly what anybody else has to do. That's a, that's a good point to emphasize. All right. The, the one uh, application I believe that I mentioned earlier, here's, here's something that's commendable about his character. And we looked at some of this this past Wednesday night. Even those who truly seek God like Cornelius was, you know, they're not likely to have it all in their minds worked out properly. There's still going to be some issues that's wrong here or there. Again, what did Cornelius do wrong when Peter got to the house? Yeah, well, I'm, no, we're not doing that now. Get up. I'm just a man like you. So there's elements here or there. There's points here or there that uh, it's just incorrect. That didn't make him no longer a candidate for baptism. He just, he just had that wrong. So sometimes people, they have some things wrong that can be dealt with just like Peter dealt with it. But he knew enough and he was interested enough to learn the truth that he made arrangements for himself. And what else is commendable? I brought my friends and I brought my relatives. I want them to hear the gospel. I'll tell you, that's commendable. That's, that's imitatable. Can I use that word? We need to imitate that. And this point we made Wednesday night, you know, he had the right attitude toward truth. He hungered and thirsted for righteousness. He was trying to seek first the kingdom of God. Those, those things are just, are just so, so important. And it's worthy of our emulation. All right. Such a great man. Such, such a great story in the New Testament. Lord willing, Wednesday night we'll pick up in chapter 11. And we'll, I think the, we do the whole chapter, I believe. I have got my syllabus in front of me. But read chapter 11, and we'll come to class prepared to discuss that chapter. Thanks again so much for your participation and your attendance.